Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. For the first time in two weeks, I've now out got gravel underneath the L322. And you find me high above the Algarve. It's way over in the distance. I'm about 45 minutes from the coast. But when you leave the Algarve Portuguese coast and then work your way inland north, the landscape completely changes. There are rolling hills up here. I'm on the top of a ridge line. There's some power cables running over the back. So about two weeks ago, uh, the Velta Espana sort of ended. I can't believe it was two weeks ago. And our last meetup was in Boltana. So I went through from Boltana all the way around the top of the coast, which seems like it's the wrong way to go because you want to go a direct route, but that's going through Madrid. So I worked my way down to Pamploma, Burgos, down to Salamanca, and eventually into Portugal and then to Castelo Branco. For the first time in close to a month, I actually had a shower in a hotel room and had sheets and a proper bed. It seems quite strange when you sort of add up the time that I've actually been away. And in all that time, I've been in a rooftop tent or on a ferry. But anyway, the Velta was fantastic. You might have seen the other guys sort of posting content on social media, Instagram. They've been doing YouTube videos as well, but we had a great time. And as my announcement about putting an adventure, Overland Forward Adventures, we're planning on doing this trip next year. So the L322 was put into an underground car park at a resort on the Algarve. And in two weeks, I probably maybe did 20 miles. That was it. So this thing's at a really good rest. And what I want to do is to sort of walk you through reflections of being away for this period of time. And as I've mentioned many times on the channel, you go on these types of trips. Now, whether you do weekend trips in Wales to the Lake District, either into Yorkshire, etc., or you do sort of further afield like I do. But every time you go away, you sort of evaluate your setup, the gear that you take. And for me, this last trip has really shown some deficiencies in my setup. So as the title of this video says, All Change for 23, I sort of made the decision that I'm going to change my setup and I'll walk you through what I'm going to change and my rationale behind it. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm doing away with my rooftop tent. Now, whether it gets sold or moved on, I'm not sure yet. Now, let me first say that I absolutely love my rooftop tent. It's fantastic, which begs the question while you're all sitting there is like, why then are you going to just switch it out? Well, let's go back through and show, where, show you where I've come from. So when I had the Defender and I had this tent, I had it sort of switched the other way around where the ladder went down the passenger side on a UK driven vehicle. I also had gold, wing door, uh, gold wings on the back. And what the gold wings would allow me to do is I had max, track, max tracks on the passenger side and I could drop that max tracks table down, gave me a flat surface, and then I could reach in through the gold wing, get all my cooking gear out of the vehicle, reach into the fridge, and I would have some shelter. So the way that the rooftop tent folded down, I could stand under it. And if it did get rainy, inclement, I could still cook something under there and be protected for the elements. Now with this, it's totally different because everything is in the back. Now I've got this split tailgate, which is brilliant. In this weather, not a cloud in the sky, I can sit here on the tailgate with this up. This is tinted. It gives me some, some sort of shade from the elements, specifically from the sun. So I generally don't need an awning out the back in most cases. Now what happens in inclement weather. So on the Velta, four nights in a row it rained when we got to sort of dinner time. And this, because everything is built into the back, the fridge, my nomad kitchen pulls way out. And I have no shelter at all, none. So three times I basically had to quickly finish off what I was doing, pack everything away, close it up, up into the tent. Now I can hear a lot of you saying, okay then, put an awning out the back. Well, I can't because I don't have enough space. My bag, which carries things like high lift jack and all that, drops over the back of the roof rack. So there's really no way I can fit anything up there anyway. So that's a no go. So I'm pretty much screwed. So here's my rationale and what I'm thinking of going to do is, 
whether again, whether the rooftop tent actually goes or whether it stays, I'm not sure. So I want to remove the rooftop tent and go to a ground tent. And ideally I'm looking at an Oz tent, either an RV3 or an RV4. So what's my rationale for an Oz tent? Well, they're quick to set up. They're really not that bulky and they're not that heavy. So my rationale is that I could lay an Oz tent, either an RV3 or an RV4, out the back, pull up the awning and in cover over the top here where the tailgate is. So I can attach the awning part of a, an Oz tent R3, three or four to either side of my roof rack. I can bungee it cord in and it will give me protection and it gives me shelter. That will allow me to pull out my kitchen and if I need to go cook with it, great. It doesn't mean I need to do it every single time. Now, one of the major bugbears I have with the rooftop tent is you can't stand up in it. And as somebody was mentioning on another video, I think it was Bug Out Vehicles UK, basically it's a bunk bed and they're absolutely right, it is. It's a real quick, easy way of being able to have a sleeping arrangement on top of the car, off the ground, but you can't stand up in it. You really can't get dressed in it, although you probably could at a pinch, but you'll not be able to stand up. You can't really kneel in it. It's really there as just a base to sleep in. So having something like a, an Oz tent, you can clearly stand up in it. You can clearly get changed in it. And it gives you a level of privacy that you generally don't get in a rooftop tent. The other thing is you don't have to clamber up and down the stairs. Now, some people will say, well, boo hoo, first world problems. Well, yes, but you have to get up in the middle of the night and get back in it again. It becomes a pain. So that's my rationale for doing it. Now, the pros and cons of this, the pros are quite simple is, that is 68 kilos of weight on the roof. That's a lot of weight to be carrying on a roof rack. Now you can get bigger ones than that. You can get far heavier rooftop tents. So I am saving that weight off the top of the vehicle. Now getting an RV3 or an RV4, they're going to add another 20 kilos of weight on there. So I'm pretty much saving about 45 kilos of weight. I found something on uh, Drifter Europe who actually have a platform. I think it's checker plate. It will sit there to, to allow you to mount your Oztet on your roof rack flat. It's about two meters long. So that will give me somewhere to go place it. So that's one huge positive is the weight saving to be able to ditch the tent and go with something much lighter. It also frees up huge amounts of space on that roof rack. And as you've seen pictures of the L322, you can see everything is pulled to the back. My front runner transit bag, which is an extra large bag, which has things like my hydraulic jack. God knows what else is up there. It generally never gets touched. All of that now can move. Instead of going at the back of the vehicle, I can now put it down the side of the vehicle. I could probably get another one up there as well. But my Max tracks are up there and this all sits on top of the Max tracks. So I'm freeing up more space on the roof rack and it's space that I could probably use better. Now let's look at some of the negatives of this. Up there in my rooftop tent, generally there's a sleeping bag, there is an inflatable mattress, there are two pillows, and there is a down blanket. So all of that stays up there, which is why you've seen videos of me up the ladder, and I can get that thing set up in less than a minute. It's really efficient, and when you get used to traveling, stopping, starting, one night here, one night there, it saves a huge amount of time and effort to just to be able to just pop it, climb up the stairs, put the poles in, release the valve on the self-inflated mattress, and you're pretty much there. Taking it down two minutes because you've got to tuck the sides in, but it's a real easy, simple way. So one of the negatives of this is I'm going to have to figure out how I carry sleeping bag, down blanket, inflatable mattress, pillows. Those sorts of things now are going to have to go into stuff sacks. Now, there's two things I can do. It can go into the back seat of the car, not a problem. That stuff sort of cramps down when you put it in stuff sacks. And it's soft, you can hide it behind the back in the footwell, behind the back of the driver's seat, not a problem. If I was to get a cot or a stretcher, most of those close down quite small. I've now got freed up space on the roof rack to put another transit bag in. All of that can go in there. So I'm probably gaining space, but definitely saving weight. So by going to an Oz 10, an RV3 or an RV4, I actually think I'll be downsizing my setup, but also making my setup probably better for what I really need it to do. It'll give me somewhere to stand up. 
it will give me an awning in inclement weather. And the great thing about the Oz tent is you can actually put sides on it. So in theory, I could reverse this back to where my tent is, connect up the awning, put up the sides, and from here all the way back to the living area, somewhere to put a chair, I can pull out my kitchen, and I got somewhere to sleep. So I think that is a massive positive to that as well. So one huge advantage to going to this type of setup is that if we were in, say, Salt, up in the Pyrenees, we want to do the Smuggler's Trail, then come back, have something to eat, spend the night, go and do other trails and use that as the central pay base for a couple of days. That means this thing is being opened and closed, open and closed, everything being packed away. You can't really just leave a chair. And if you're going with other people that have rooftop tents or some sort of vehicle set up, the same thing. So one huge advantage for me, as I see it, is I can set up a tent, put everything in there, and then go do a day trip. Come back, reverse this up, pull the awning over the top, I'm already set up. So I see that as a big, big advantage in this type of setup as well. The Oz tents, 30 seconds to be able to sort of take them out of the bag, drop them on there, kick the feet out, lift it up, done. To actually getting it off the roof, probably add another minute. And the same thing with setting all that up. Now, as soon as you put up awnings and you put up side curtains and things like that, it's going to add time. It's just the same with this. When I drop this and want to put the awning up, it's probably another 10 or 15 minutes. I've got it down pretty pat by now, but it's still adding time. But this is sort of, in my opinion, will be a better setup. So I'm going to go to that setup in 23 and then test it out again next year and see what it is. Now, if I decide to go sell the tent, then I'll sell it with everything that I have. The extra room, which I haven't used, in, I've only used once. The awning, which I've used quite a few times. The shower rain hood over the, the stairs. All of that will go as one package. But I'm going to wait and see how this new setup looks. Um, if somebody wants to make me an offer for the tent, you will know what they cost. Um, probably accept something like 50% of the original tent value and throw in the rest of the stuff. So if you're interested, let me know. So anyway, that's the change that I'm going to put in place for 23. Vehicle itself, there's one other thing that I've got on order. And I know I was poking fun at Mr. ASPW last week. Actually, I wasn't poking fun. I was just saying, hey, you're wrong, mate. Oh, and thank you for the juvenile penile references from one person. Um, it's good to know that my male attachment in inches is more than your IQ level. But thanks for that. So. One thing that they do have that I really like is that they've got something called an Egon hub. So that is very similar to my Red Vision system where it's a switching board, it's got fuses in it, they've got a relay hub they've just come out with. One thing that's just been released, which I've now got, it was on back order, is one of their water hubs. Now behind the back of this Nomad kitchen is a water pump. Now the water pump is connected to my 50 litre water tank which is behind the back of my seats. But the, basically the way it works is fill up the tank, the water pump pumps it out here with a the tap, and that's all controlled from my Red Vision system. This is all well and good. I've got a shower attachment to it. I can pump water out. The only downside is the water is cold, and I'm not a big fan of cold showers. I don't know many people that actually are. I'm sure a few of them will pipe up. Good for you, not for me. And washing up with cold water as well, especially first thing in the morning, not a good thing. If you're doing the type of trails that we've done in the Velta and you do the wild camp, camp, wild camp, you're going 48 hours without a proper wash. And as I've mentioned before, some of us can basically start wet wiping everything, but you get pretty grubby and grimy. It gets dirty, it gets dusty, and you just need to go and basically cleanse yourself. What I'm going to do now with the Egon Water Hub is it all, I'm also ordered a six litre Aquios, I think that's the name of it, is a water heater. It's a tankless water heater. It's really small. And I believe that will go behind the back of this Nomad kitchen. I can screw it on the back. But the water hub itself has two pumps in it. And that will go up against this board here. And it's got a mixing valve. So you can take feed from the water tank, have cold water, take another feed from the water tank through the hot water heater, and then set a temperature valve and then basically have warm or hot water. It comes with a shower attachment, uh, which is pressurized, so when you hit it, turn it off, the pump doesn't run. 
So you can have a hot shower. It's got another attachment as well where it will override through the mixing valves at everything inside the pumps where you can basically got a little, like you have in your sink, you can do a little spray. And I've got a sink built into my kitchen. So I got hot water into that sink, all that good stuff. You can also do the cold water. One really cool thing it has, but I don't know whether I would actually use it, is it has an external hookup as well. So the two pumps are controlled independently of each other. There's a secondary pump in there where you can actually run, that comes in the shower kit, a nozzle with a filter on the end. You can drop it in a bucket or drop it in a stream, hit the pump. It will suck the water up into the system. It will heat it for you as well. So it's okay if you're gonna have a shower, you know, from a stream, put the water in, and then you can basically shower with what they would call green water as opposed to using your fresh water in your tank for drinking and all the other bits and pieces. So anyway, that's on order. I think it's actually on, um, on the aircraft now on its way over to the UK. So by the time I get back in a couple of weeks, um, I should be able to go and fit that. It won't take long. It's really just a case of putting the hub onto the back of my board over here and then just plumbing everything in. Um, and I'm, I've got all the wiring and everything set up. The pumps would run directly off my lithium battery. I'll just bypass the Red Vision system because they're on independent switches and we should be good to go. So I think that will be a pretty good install as well. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting back and putting that in. So that will be the second part of although my camping setup will change, having a hot water heater and then controlling those pumps independently of the pump that I have now, I think it will make it a better experience for me doing these form of travels in warm, dusty, hot climates. Now, as and when all of this kit comes, when I put the orders in and do the things I need to do, I'll make sure that I'll be putting videos out. I'll probably go, there's a place up in, uh, near, in Herefordshire called Nash Wild Camping. Some of you may have been there in the UK and then do a couple of nights wild camping. You can do some laning in Wales as well. Um, and just test everything out and see how it works in real life before I decide to go and flog the tent to somebody that wants it. By the way, if you're not a Land Rover fan, you'll have to figure out how to get all the stickers off the roof. They'll come off quite easy. And I've got the Raptor version of the top of that tent, which is a godsend because if it was the smooth clear coat, it would be scratched to death by now. But I've got the Raptor coating on the top of the tent on the hard shell. Um, you can clean it up if you get the Meguiar's black, take all the stickers off and then run the Meguiar's black into the Raptor coating. It will put the shine back on and take the scratches out. There are scratches. Of course, there's scratches. I've been under a lot of trees and branches. You saw some of that in the footage. Um, there's nothing major. There's no gouges out of it or anything. It's just superficial. The tent still works. It's still uh, watertight. No problem. But as I've mentioned many, many times, I think a lot of people go through this you begin to understand what works for you and what doesn't. And I'm now beginning to realize, although I've spent close to 100 nights in that thing now, it's probably not the right thing for the type of travel that I'm doing. I do love it, I really do. It's comfortable, it really is comfortable up there. But I think for the setup and everything, especially like sitting under here and trying to protect yourself from any of the elements when it's raining, it might be time for a change. So anyway, I hope that was interest to you. More videos will be on their way. I am going to leave this wonderful site up here and head over to Segres for the night. There's a campsite right at the bottom of Segres. I'll probably hang out there for a couple of nights and then work my way up the Portuguese coast, see if I can get a couple of nights wild camping in up to Lisbon and probably on my way back. But we'll, uh, we'll see about that. And with that, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.